Medical service companies' non-invasive ventilation patients benefit from a unique follow-up program. Each patient in our ventilation program receives three home visits from a respiratory therapist within the first 30 days of therapy. CAT scores are monitored to help identify improvements or changes in the patient's quality of life. A CAT score drop of two points is clinically significant in a positive way. Patients enrolled in our program experience on average a five point drop in CAT scores within the first three months. As we know, any improvement in a COPD patient's quality of life can be a huge impact. This program also benefits the patient by providing device and disease education, wellness support, as well as the ability to develop a personal relationship with their dedicated respiratory therapist. At MSC, our goal is to prevent hospitalizations and improve the quality of life for our patients. If you have a COPD patient who would benefit from this therapy and this robust clinical follow-up program, contact us today. Visit medicalserviceco.com to learn more. Good afternoon. I hope you're enjoying this day of education. Our next respiratory lecture this afternoon is being presented by Dr. Michael McLeland. Dr. McLeland is an RPSGT and also a PhD in education. Additionally, Michael has a master's degree in curriculum and instructional design and a bachelor's degree in business. Michael has been a technologist for over 20 years and is currently the manager and technical director for the Sleep Center at St. Louis Children's Hospital in St. Louis, Missouri. Michael is passionate about sleep research, has a keen interest in pediatric PAP compliance. He created the first support group for children on PAP therapy and their parents. Michael has played an active role in sleep education at both the state and local levels, where he established an ASTEP program and AAS degree program at Washington University School of Medicine, where he also teaches. Michael continues to work with physicians and fellows during their pediatric sleep training and continues to teach pediatric sleep in the ASTEP program at Washington University in St. Louis. Michael is a prominent speaker on the importance of good sleep. We are grateful to have Dr. McLeland share his expertise with us today. We look forward to hearing about his research as he shares his knowledge and lectures on high flow, an alternative to CPAP in the pediatric population. As a reminder, please enter any questions or comments you may have in the Engage tab above the presentation screen. So this is um, a presentation on experience with high flow, high humidity as a treatment for sleep disorder breathing in two uh, challenging groups in children. <clears throat> so I have nothing to declare, including no conflict of interest. The research did not receive any specific grant from funding agencies in the public, commercial, or non-for-profit sectors. <clears throat> so the objective today is to identify the equipment needed for successful high flow titrations, implement procedures on how to titrate high flow, and understand how high flow may be uh, useful in an alternative to PAP um, in a sleep center, and explain how high flow could be used as an alternative in those patients less than two, and then those patients greater than two years of age. And explain the difference between high flow and PAP. So the prevalence of sleep disordered breathing, <clears throat> it's estimated about 5% of the pediatric population has some, type, uh, some degree of sleep disordered breathing. But this is probably underestimated. It's probably a lot more than uh, the 5% that's estimated just because um, of uh, the infrequently um, screening of sleep disorder breathing and um, kind of in the general practice of medicine. And then also there's a lot of limited access to pediatric sleep laboratories. Um, so most sleep labs are, it takes about 12 months to get in to, for the child to have a sleep study. Um, the sleep lab itself is kind of booked out between the 12 or six to 12 months. And then also most of them have, will have to see a sleep physician before they're actually seen in the sleep lab. So then that can take another three or four months to get in. Um, so again, so a lot of patients go undiagnosed with sleep disordered breathing um, because of that. And then there's a, also a continued increase in childhood obesity. And we're seeing this more and more, even with the pandemic, um, children not going to school and being homeschooled, 
uh, and not having the activities that they normally would outside of school, like sports and um, gymnastics and stuff like that. Uh, sleep disorder breathing is also common in children with neurodevelopmental and uh, craniofacial abnormalities. Example, 60, greater than 65% of children with trisomy uh, 21 or Down syndrome have sleep disordered breathing. And then about 79% of those with uh, Prader-Willi syndrome also have sleep disorder breathing. And both of these syndromes um, are kind of, the sleep disorder breathing is more of central and obstructive in nature. And then we also see autism at about 8% of that population. <clears throat> so the main takeaway is that these populations have a higher prevalence of sleep disorder breathing than those without. And the most common uh, treatment options for sleep disorder breathing in kids between the ages of two to 18 is a TNA or a tonsillectomy, adenoidectomy, um, PAP, a trach, a trach vent, or O2. Um, and then kids usually under the age of two is usually, PAP is kind of questionable. Here at St. Louis Children's Hospital, we don't do PAP on those less than two, just because there's a, a safety risk, one, uh, for a chance of uh, suffocation from the CPAP mask, or two, um, if they're sick or if they happen to vomit, um, and they can't take off that mask quick enough. And so they can aspirate. Uh, so them are the two main risks of why we, we here at Children's don't do PAP. Um, and then a TNA is also kind of, it really depends on the severity of the sleep disordered breathing. Um, ENT usually likes to wait until they're over the age of two to do any kind of surgery on these patients. Um, sometimes they will go in and just do the adenoidectomy and wait for the tonsils. Uh, but again, this is kind of uh, depending on the sleep disorder breathing. Uh, uh, other avenues is a trach or a trach vent, and these are kind of really invasive uh, um, treatments for the sleep disorder breathing. Uh, O2 is very popular because basically what it does is um, it decreases the patient from desatting and um, being hypoxic during the night. But then also this hypoxemia usually will increase arousals during sleep. So it kind of decreases the arousals, increases the oxygen saturations, um, and then we get more of a consolidated sleep, but it's not a, a, as good of a treatment as using PAP or a trach vent. Um, so those are kind of the um, main reasons. Uh, and also the Food and Drug Administration or the FDA has approved PAP for children whose weight is above 30 kilos. So when you're looking at 30 kilos, this is kind of the average weight of a 15 or 16 year old. And so treating patients with PAP becomes a little bit more tricky when they're under this age or this weight limit. And then you have the, um, so age, cranial facial malformations, cognitive ability, to cooperate with positive airway pressure is also needs to be entered into if patients are going to accept wearing the CPAP or PAP. Um, <clears throat> and then among adults, of course, there's a lot more treatments for sleep disordered breathing. So there's um, mandibular vascular devices, implantable um, nerve stimulators that are uh, kind of stimulate the tongue and um, make it more rigid to kind of open up the airway. And then there's weight loss surgery. And then there's also other multiple surgical and medical interventions for adults, but we're really limited when it comes to the pediatric side. And pa uh, CPAP and BiPAP is, was invented more than 40 years ago. And, and in pediatrics, we haven't figured out anything or found anything else that can be an alternative um, unless we're going really invasive, like the traitor, trach or vent uh, um, treatments. <clears throat> so CPAP compliance kind of ranges and varies sleep lab to sleep lab, but in really in pediatric, it can range from anywhere between patients being compliant on PAP from 40 to about 60%. Um, one study 
done in 2006. It, this is what was looking at 79 children and they found that 82% were successful and established wearing PAP during the 46 month period that they were following these patients. Um, objective compliance data was available on the 50 of those 65 patients. 66% uh, were boys, 78% had a complicated medical disorder, and the mean age was uh, 10 plus or minus five years, so anywhere between five to 15 years of age. And the median um, apnea hypopnea index, or AHI, was around 11.3. Now, when they said successfully established and compliant on data, this can kind of be misleading. So you have to make sure you're reading all the research because their compliance was defined as one or more hours of recording during 24 hour period. So really the child was wearing an hour per day. Um, and remember a child can sleep anywhere between 10 to 14 hours per day. Um, so I wouldn't really consider this as compliance, but um, each center kind of defines their own compliance in, in the pediatric side of medicine. <clears throat> but we really should be looking at like this research here is a little bit more accurate of what we're, we're seeing across the pediatric field. And this is overall compliance is about 49%. So they had 140 patients, 69 of them were compliant. And they define compliance as the 70% uh, nightly use wearing it at least four hours or more per night. Um, of the de demographic data collected during the study, the age, sex, insurance status, only female sex was associated with better compliance or adherence. Uh, the severity of OSA um, did not really play into part on compliance. So if they had severe sleep apnea, mild or moderate sleep apnea, it didn't matter if they were compliant. Also the uh, therapeutic pressure and uh, the residual AHI did not play uh, a part in compliance as well. And, and, uh, what it did show though, is the female patients with trisomy 21 tended to be more adherent, <clears throat> uh, but this wasn't really significant in their study, but they just found that more female patients with Down syndrome or trisomy 21 was more adherent to wearing the PAP device. <clears throat> So we at Children's, we have a huge um, support system in place. We have sleep educators that are um, monitoring uh, CPAP compliance on a weekly basis. And when they're monitoring compliance, they're, if someone's not compliant on PAP, they're calling the parents and kind of trying to find out why. Um, and then there, there's, issues, then they're bringing them back into our PAP clinic. And this is solely ran by our sleep educators. So each patient has an hour time ded dedicated to them with the sleep educators. And they kind of go through more education with uh, the PAP, um, refitting them with uh, a mask if we have to, um, maybe including our ramp into the PAP um, pressure. Uh, kind of make it more a little bit more easier for them to comply with. We also have a multidisciplinary sleep clinic that meets on Tuesdays and Thursdays every week. And this involves pulmonary and neurology sleep medicine, ENT, psychology. We also have the sleep educator in this clinic as well, as well as a sleep navigator. And our sleep navigator was actually featured in the sleep review magazine. Um, and we kind of look at these two positions differently. Um, in the sleep review, the sleep nav, if you read it, it the, each sleep navigator kind of had different roles. Um, and we kind of divide those roles between the sleep navigator and the sleep educator. And the sleep navigator really helps to make sure that patients know where to go, uh, where they're being referred from outside. Um, and our hospital system is a huge system. And um, patients can be easily lost. So she kind of keeps, helps keeps track of these patients coming in, um, making sure they're uh, finding their appointments and showing up on time. And if there's any problems, she's finding ways to uh, make sure those problems can be lessened for the patients uh, and the parents. 
the sleep educator again is more of the education side of um, sleep. Uh, uh, so they play a really big part in the clinic. And the clinic was is with all these physicians and um, the sleep educator and navigator are all there and their patients kind of rotating through each one um, to better help uh, take care of our patients. <clears throat> So we were started to be interested in high humidity. Uh, Dr. Hawkins' group out of Colorado uh, published a few page, uh, papers on high flow and kind of got us kicked our interest because we were looking at other ways um, to help our patients be compliant with uh, uh, with some type of treatment for this uh, breathing disorders. So we really got interested in high flow, and then the, really the intended purpose for high flow is not was never developed to treat sleep apnea, but it was really to decrease the need for a ventilator. So pre and post intubation, um, and it's really the re respiratory support through the uh, rededication of dead airspace and the delivery of dynamic positive airway pressure. It also creates uh, more of a airway hydration by creating 100% humidification and this humidification makes it a lot more comfortable for patients to wear. Uh, and then we can ask, also add in supplemental oxygen if we're required. And there's a big difference between high flow and CPAP. It's like comparing apples to oranges. So high flow is measured by liters per minute and CPAP is measured by water, uh, centimeters of water pressure. Uh, again, the, the high flow is delivered uh, um, by 100% humidity, so the, the air is really moist and uh, really easier to um, accept than something like uh, CPAP or even low flow oxygen if uh, there's no humidity. So the question is always at being asked, so how much is high flow really delivering in, in when we're looking at comparing it to CPAP? And to be honest, really no one knows. Uh, so Mushe Lee's group um, stated that the average pressure of flow is two liters per kilogram per minute, equaled about four centimeters of water pressure. Fisher and Pakel says it's around one centimeter of water pressure per 10 liters per minute. And, this, and the reason why it's so hard to measure is because one, CPAP is a more of a closed system. Um, it's covering the nose and or mouth, depending on the mask. Um, we try to make sure limit the leak around the mask. There's a built-in leak um, that we can measure. High flow is only to really take up no more than 50% of the space in the nares or in the nose. And um, the patient can also breathe through their mouth. So then that really affects what exact pressure that the patient's getting. But Mule Shi's group, basically when they were doing this research, <clears throat> they're measuring uh, pharyngeal pressure at the rate of one liter per minute. And it appeared to be more of a sine wave <clears throat> when we're looking at this picture here in the, in the slide. And the sine wave was always, uh, at one liter per minute was just a negative positive. And they keep in, kept increasing it by one liter per minute until they reached more of a positive pressure. So the whole sine wave became positive and created more of a, a, a CPAP type of pressure. And, until, and this didn't happen until they reached seven liters per minute when it finally reached this positive um, sinal wave that we're seeing here on the graph. So again, it's really hard to measure unless you're using the pharyngeal pressure. Um, and of course you can't do that when you're doing the titration because when you're me measuring this pharyngeal pressure, there's a tube that goes actually inside the nose um, and down the, the airway and through the airway. And so you're blocking the airway even more. Um, so of course, we can't measure this when we're doing uh, titration. <clears throat> so the methods of, so we ended up doing, uh, developing a protocol for our high flow. 
And we actually ran a few patients over the course of a year. And this, um, so we ended up doing kind of a retrospective analysis of the patients that we did on high flow titrations. Uh, we used uh, the FNP Airvo 2 with the nasal cuneal interface to deliver the high flow. <clears throat> now, high flow has been used in the NICU for many years, to, to, uh, and they used it to really de to treat the desaturations and the pulmonary issues. And they've done this for many years with any adverse effects or any safety concerns. So we felt like pretty confident this was going to be safe for our patients and, and with Dr. Hawkins' group as well, uh, what they published. <clears throat> so what we, uh, we had 14 patients, seven of these patients were less than two, and then seven of these patients were uh, between the ages of uh, two and 14. Uh, with uh, neural developmental disorders. <clears throat> and both groups of patients had um, persistent documented PAP noncompliance, um, despite multiple times meeting with the parent and patient and supplying a lot of education, masks changes for the CPAP, and also changing a lot of the features on the, uh, the PAP machines. So these patients were noncompliant on PAP, and they were naive to high flow. So they've never, they, at this point, they had never experienced high flow at all. <clears throat> so all patients also had a baseline um, <clears throat> study along with a CPAP titration and a high flow study uh, if they were over the age of two. Those less than two, we had a, at least a baseline study and then the titration of high flow. Again, instead of putting the patients on bring them back for an oxygen titration to kind of keep, stabilize their um, oxygen saturations during the night. We just brought them back for the high flow titration. Um, the sleep studies were scored according to the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, the manual for scoring sleep and associated events. Um, at this time, we were using 2.5, 2.6 is the current one, but 2.5. Not much changes in the respiratory event or stages of sleep, so um, felt very confident in, in our results. The diagnosis of the OSA or sleep disorder breathing was defined by, <clears throat> according to the um, International Classification of Sleep Disorders, the third edition. And the goal for high flow titration was to identify an optimal flow, which was defined as an O, AHI or a obstructive apnea hypopnea index of less than five. <clears throat> and this is just kind of a, a brief picture, or a, a picture of what the supplies that we've used. So our Airvo, we have our circuit here. Um, we have a T connector for our sample line. Um, this was used to get a pressure channel or pressure flow. We call it a PTAF. And then also we added in after a couple patients, after trial and error, we added in a thermistor. Now thermistor um, is just measuring temperature from the patients and when they breathe in, it's a lot cooler than when they breathe out. So we can see fluctuations in their breathing. And I'll explain in a little bit why we added the um, thermistor. So a pressure transducer was connected directly to the high flow circuit. Uh, replacing the sample lines happened often because of the high humidity would clog the sample lines, giving us a poor pressure flow. And that's kind of why we ended up adding in the thermistor. But according to the ASM's alternative criteria to score respiratory events, um, we could use the thermistor or the calibrated rip sum. Now the calibrated rip sum is basically the chest and abdomen effort is being introduced into a modular. That device then is creating an algorithm that creates an, a flow. And it's, it's a mathematical equation that this is creating the flow. And basically what it comes out to, we have, <clears throat> uh, this is an example of a sleep study in the channels that we're looking at when we're diagnosing sleep disordered breathing. And as you can see here, our flow or our PTAF channel is pretty non-existent. 
Um, but then if you look at our sum, and here's basically our breathing. So if you look at the thermistor and the sum, this is basically what's coming out of their mouth and or, no, or nose. And some examples of respiratory events when, um, so this is a obstructive hypopnea. Notice in the sum channel, we have the decrease in flow and flat, the decrease in flattening of flow with a desaturation of at least 3%. Um, patients asleep. Uh, notice we don't really see this in our thermistor. We do, some could argue if this is really a 30% decrease in flow to be able to mark it as a hypopnea. Um, notice if you're looking at this, you're only looking at two breaths that may be decreased enough. Um, here we can, in the sum channel, we can actually see when it starts and when it ends. And this is just a second example here of the hypopnea and the reason. So this is just kind of explaining the reason why we use the sum channel and the thermistor. <clears throat> Again, I'm really good about picking out hypopneas, uh, but one thing it's not good, or and another thing it's good at is picking up central apneas. Now, if there's no effort in the chest and no effort, effort in the abdomen, there's not going to, there's not going to be any flow or breathing out of the nose or mouth because the chest and abdomen, the diaphragm is not moving. Um, so easy enough to pick up. <clears throat> what, what the sum channel doesn't really pick up very well is when it's an obstructive apnea, such as this example here, we see that, uh, when you're, uh, an apnea, remember, is just a complete sensation of flow, and which is what we're seeing here. But notice our sum channel, we still have some movement. But this is just because during obstructive apnea, your chest and your abdomen is still moving. So the sum channel to create a flat signal from these two channels um, is, makes it really difficult. So in the end, what is going to happen is you're going to overscore or um, overestimate how many hypopneas the patient had. But during a titration, it doesn't matter because you're going to increase pressure or increase the flow um, to help open the airway, no matter if it's an obstructive apnea or an obstructive hypopnea, right? So um, in the long run, it, it doesn't matter as much when we're doing this type of titration. Uh, here's a picture here of the actual uh, kind of setup. Um, so we have the T-tube. Here's the uh, nasal cannula for the high flow. And this is the tubing or the circuit that connects to the Fisher and Pickle air valve. Um, here in between the two, we have the T-valve with the sample line and then our pressure transducer, the, the device measuring the pressure um, being connected then to the sleep. Um, the sleep system to collect the data. And then here is an example of what the, uh, the nasal cannula looks like. Again, there are a lot, the nasal cannula is a lot bigger than what you would think for, for oxygen. Again, we want to include at least 50% of the nares. So each nostril, we want to include no more than 50%, uh, but close to 50% as possible. Uh, underneath of it is our thermistor. Again, we added this in after a couple patients, and I'll show examples here. <clears throat> so here's one of our first patients. This actually is not a channel. I should have actually took this channel off, this therm channel, um, because it was really just the PTAF. Uh, PTAF channel is pretty good, um, and our sum channel on this few epics isn't good just because of our belts. Uh, should be readjusted because again, some channels only as good as what your belt channel or your effort channels are going to be. <clears throat> so later in the night, the same patient, the, as you can see, this PTAP channel gets, uh, the channel is really hard to read. Um, so the sleep tech is having to go in and change this, uh, the sample line and it'll get better. Um, for a while, and then we'll keep having to do this throughout the night, just because of the high humidity that the um, high flow is giving. Again, so this is a different patient. We have to add in the therm channel, and notice the therm channel is really good. So if we have a therm channel and the sum channel, um, we're good to go. Uh, 
QTAF channel is always going to be more difficult because of the humidity. Uh, we were kind of reluctant. The reason why we didn't start out with the therm channel was because we were we really didn't think we would see much fluctuation in um, temperature with the uh, with the breathing coming in versus going out, just because of the high humidity. It means it's a lot warmer air going in, and it's about the same coming out. So we didn't think we'd see much fluctuation. But once we tried a patient, we saw that it gave us, we did have a good channel and a good uh, signal. We went ahead and started doing it with all of our patients. And this is a complete setup here. Uh, we have the patient, we have the circuit, the device, um, heated humidifier sitting kind of like on a hot plate. Uh, when you're doing high flows, you really need, you can't just have water in the humidifier chamber itself. You really have to bleed in uh, water so you can have, because it goes through water so much because of the high humidity. So you really have to have a lot of water to make sure you don't burn up your uh, humidifier system. Um, so you just keep it uh, uh, flowing in. So the Airbo 2 has two modes. It's, there's a pediatric and an adult mode. Uh, the pediatric mode starts at a minimum of two liters per minute. And the adult mode will start out at a minimum of 10 liters per minute. And it's really um, dependent on the cannula or the size of the cannula that you use. So if you use a pediatric cannula, you can't, the machine is sensitive to, enough to know that you it won't let you uh, put the machine into an adult mode. Um, if it is in an adult mode, when you turn it on and you have a pediatric cannula hooked up, it will throw an error and it'll kind of shut down. It won't let you continue on. And vice versa with an adult cannula, you can't run it in a pediatric mode. The machine is sensitive to know um, and they can sense the flow um, coming in and out of that cannula and it'll throw an error where you can't use it. So when you turn on the machine, um, this is kind of the top of the machine and the buttons. Uh, <clears throat> you turn it on, there's your mode button to kind of select through the different modes that will go through. And then this, once you're in a mode, you can turn it up or down depending on the mode that you're in. Uh, so when you first turn it, the machine on, it'll kind of cycle through uh, these screens. So it'll tell you when it was last dis uh, disinfected. Um, it'll kind of calibrate itself to get up to the, the last settings that it was on when it was turned off. And then it'll go to this, uh, <clears throat> keep continuing into the next screen. And then this is our final screen. And it's just telling us our temperature, how many liters per minute, and the FiO2 reading. Unless you're, unless you're adding in oxygen, this will, continue, this will just stay at 21%. So once it's done calibrating and it's and you can switch them to the different modes, uh, the first mode, once you click on mode, the first screen will take you to the temperature. And the pediatric and adult, they both have different temperatures that you can set this at. Um, so you can set the settings, but we just keep it at the default settings at all time for the temperature. Uh, you press the, press the mode button again, it'll take you to the liters per minute. Just use the arrows up here to move it up or down um, to get your whatever liters per minute that you want. You press mode again, it'll take you to the FiO2 screen. Again, you can't adjust the FiO2 uh, by this, the buttons up and down buttons. Um, the only way you can adjust the FiO2 is bleeding in oxygen from the head wall if you have one or an O2 concentrator. The more uh, oxygen that you bleed into the, to the AIRVO2, the higher your FiO2 will increase. Um, so once the machine is set and you choose the setting that you want, so we started always started out at a minimum of five liters per minute um, for pediatric patients, um, depending on the nasal cannula, of course. But once we are on this screen, it will stay on the screen Unfortunately, these machines don't integrate into our sleep systems. So if it was like CPAP or even a ventilator, we can adjust these pressures through our sleep system. With this device, we can't do that. So the 
the staff has to actually go into the room every time they need to increase pressure. Um, but we'll get into when they increase it and how much. <clears throat> so there's four sizes for the FMP um, Optiflow Junior Cannulas. There's premature, neonate, infant, and pediatric. So we always started all of our patients in the if they were wearing a pediatric cannula. Some of our patients were pediatric patients that would wear adult cannula depending on the size of their nares. Um, the large we would never go up to a large adult, but most uh, we had a few patients where the um, adult small, uh, so we would then have to uh, start differently. But in pediatric mode, we would start at five liters per minute, and then we'll we would titrate then five liters per minute increments uh, for uh, obstructive events or um, desaturations during the sleep study. Now, if they were using the adult cannulas, there's three sizes, small, medium, and large. <clears throat> and the, the um, Ervo will only let us start at 10 liters per minute for adult cannulas. So if it was a pediatric patient, wearing a small cannula, we would start at 10 liters per minute, but we would still increase only at five liters per minute increments. <clears throat> Our cannulas were fitted following the recommendations. Again, just no more than 50%, but close to 50% occlusion as possible. <clears throat> so our goal was to increase high flow in the rate um, during the titration obstructions um, for the obstructions of hypopneas, obstructive apneas, and or snoring were eliminated. In our maximum, we would go to was 25 liters per minute uh, if we had to reach that, um, or if we got rid of the obstructions, so whichever kind of came first. Oxygen was added through the AIRVO and FI2 was titrated through the head wall or an oxygen concentrator. Here we have on, in all of our rooms, we have a, a head wall unit with oxygen. If there is hypoxemia or if the maximum flow was reached and the saturations persisted, we would add the O2. Um, our policy with high flow is to start and adjust supplemental O2 if SpO2 um, is consistently below 90% after increasing high flow to 15 liters per minute. So once we reach the 15 liters per minute, uh, we would then add the oxygen if we need to, and then still titrate up five until we hit 25. <clears throat> so we used the Wilcoxon signed uh, rank test, was used to compare changes between the baseline and titration studies in the following areas. So total, apnea hypopnea index or the AHI, obstructive apnea hypopnea index, the OHI, the obstructive uh, hypopnea index, rapid eye movement AHI, um, obstructive apnea index, and the SPO2, SPO2 desaturation index. Um, approval for this research was uh, done through our human research uh, protection office at Washington University of School of Medicine. And we'll kind of go through the results now. So between July of 2019 and March of 2020, we performed 14 high flow titration studies. Data from all 14 patients were included in this analysis. No one was uh, uh, taken out of the study for any reason. Um, the youngest patient was 11 months old and the oldest was 18 years old. And 64% of the patients were male. <clears throat> There were seven patients less than two years of age of the patients greater than two. Six out of the seven had some kind of a neurodevelopmental disorder of, that were often associated with cranial facial and abnormalities. Um, so there were three trisomy 21 patients, uh, one Prater Willie, one with CP, and one, one with KFS. Only one patient out of the uh, seven that were older than two um, was developmentally normal. Uh, when we talk about uh, cranial facial abnormalities, so trisomy 21, uh, when we think of 
cranial facial abnormalities, we think of kind of like the bridge of the nose. They really have no bridge of the nose. So it's really difficult for these patients to be fitted with like a mask, a CPAP mask that goes over the nose or the mouth uh, because of a lot of leakage of air around or by the eyes and around the bridge of the nose. Because a lot of all the masks are really built on having people with a bridge, a nose, a bridge that the mask will kind of seal around. Um, and then they also have a smaller mandible and they have a larger tongue. Um, so that's kind of what we're thinking of when we're thinking of cranial facial abnormalities. <clears throat> so when we're looking at the results of high flow of those less than two, so from 11 months to 23 months, we were really looking at the OAHI baseline and treatment. <clears throat> and what we saw is that we saw four of the seven have an OAHI that met our goal of less than five. Um, all but one, we saw a 50% or more decrease in the AHI, which is great because there's, if they don't wear CPAP, the only alternative is going to be a vent or and trach or and trach. So we want to, so this kind of, even though, for instance, like patient who was uh, had an uh, who had a OHI of forty six, we were able to drop them down to three point two um, events per hour. Uh, here, this patient at twenty one months old had forty point five events per hour, but wearing high flow, they were dropped down to fifteen point nine. We were still happy with these results because we wouldn't be able to get these results unless they were on a vent trach um, or, and we wouldn't be able to get these results on um, O2. So this is kind of a chart of what we are looking at. More, to, We'll discuss more of this in a couple more slides. This next graph here or table is looking at those that are older than two. Um, of no, we are, I, we are missing, like a, there is a gap between patients uh, between the ages of 10 and 17 uh, that just happened we didn't study. So there is a gap between these this group. Um, but overall, we were happy with the results still because of we were able to um, get a few of them to meet our goal of the OHI less than five. Um, but majority of these at least we were able to decrease it by at least 50%. Especially with somebody, this was an 18 year old Down syndrome, very obese, um, who had an AHI of 114. We were able to drop it with high flow to 42.6. Still not optimal, but still a huge improvement. Um, kind of look at something's better than nothing type of uh, mentality when it comes to when they're not compliant with any other treatment. Um, again, some more data on what's um, significantly different, uh, and we'll go more in details here. It's kind of busy, um, but it, it really shows improvement in all groups is a significant improvement. We'll discuss that here. So <clears throat> five subjects or 35.7 subjects, um, percent su subjects did not achieve an optimal fl uh, flow, uh, which you remember our optimal was less than five OAHI. Two um, were less than two years of age or 14.2% were less than two. Three were 21.4% were greater than two years of age. Of the three older subjects who did not attain an optimal flow, two were 18 year olds. Uh, with morbid obesity and trisomy 21. Um, oxygen from one to four liters per minute was started on three of the five patients who did not achieve an optimal flow because of the SpO2 uh, was less than 90%. And then the lowest was, uh, the lowest reading we received on one was 50%. <clears throat> there were significant differences in four of the six indices that we were looking at for high flow. So we saw significant differences in the OAI or the apnea 
obstructive apnea index, the AHI, the OAHI, and the rapid eye movement sleep AHI. Uh, and then remember, we did this as paired comparisons. So we looked at each individual who had treat or baseline and treatment. There was no significant differences found between these two, um, the obstructive hypopnea index and the desaturation index. The desaturation index was close. Our cutoff for a significant difference was point, anything below 0 0.05. Um, so we were, if it was close, but didn't meet the criteria for significant difference. Uh, high flows was accepted. Um, no parent or patient was refused this method during the titration. Uh, there was no adverse events reported during the high flow titration. And this was this is consistent with studies showing the safety of high flow in preterm newborns. Um, a lot of published data in the NICU um, population um, kind of shows this as well. So why does high flow work? And the question uh, often comes up and no one knows for sure, but um, although PAP is presumed to be a, more of a pneumatic splint that's kind of keeping the airway open, high flow may be working just a little bit differently. And it may, may, some may, some or many think it may be more of a reflex than a splint. So a proposed hypothesis is that high flow increases airway patency by reflexology, increasing upper airway tone and part of the reflex stimulated by airflow. So FAMES group <clears throat> proposes that positive pressure during expiration prevents small airway collapse, kind of like a stinting, stinting effect. And it creates a prolonged expiratory time compared to flow and reduces uh, the auto peak. There was an interesting study done um, on uh, preterm babies. Um, it's called uh, Mechanical Sensory um, Stimulation. It was published in 2009. And basically what they did was take preterm infants, um, gestational age of less than 36 weeks, but post-conceptual age of 30 weeks. Um, and they had spontaneous breathing during room air. Uh, they did uh, receive O2 at a fixed rate. And the stimulation that was created was they took a mattress and basically mounted speakers within the mattress. And they used a sounding board to create this 60 hertz uh, filtered white noise. And the reason why they used this frequency range was selected based on previous observations within the neonate showing that the stimulation in this range creates respiratory rhythm and apnea reduction without causing any type of arousal from sleep. And then there was near uniform displacement. So the vibration happened throughout the entire mattress. And during the study, they were recording EEG, SpO2, and effort, chest and abdomen effort. And this graph kind of shows uh, they did it in two phases in the morning and then in the evening. Uh, you can see when they turned off, when the, the stimulation was turned off, uh, the patient had a lot more of this periodic type of breathing. And then notice when they turned it on, this periodic breathing kind of decreased. And it's better shown in my next slide here. Here, patients having periodic breathing, you can kind of see in the pauses here with each. And then as soon as they turn on the stimulation, their breathing really normalized. They have regular breathing. <clears throat> and then as soon as they turn it off, they still have normal breathing for a little bit. But then as it, it keeps going, the recordings keep going, they start going back into this more periodic breathing. And that and they kept doing this every 20 or so minutes. Um, this, to show that how the stimulation would work on breathing. 
of course, there's a lot of other mechanisms and play or theories kind of of why high flow works besides just reflex. Um, there's also theories of kind of like washout. And basically what washout is, is like high flow that provides washout of the a nasal pharyngeal space, which then contributes to establishing improved fraction of the velar gases and with respect to carbon dioxide and as well as oxygen. Also, there's resistance and the other three uh, met metabolic work associated with gas conditioning um, and then distending pressure for lung recruitment. We won't go too much into that. Um, so unlike PAP machines, it's currently not possible to download detailed data from the AIRVO. So we know with CPAP machines, we can download um, estimated AHI, we can down, uh, it also gives us exact time that the patient is wearing it versus just the machine just being on. So the PAP machines can sense when it's actually, the mask is on the face. So the Airbo, we don't get detailed data like that. The only thing that will give us is this duration that the machine was on. Um, and then also what needs to happen is methods to develop a, more of a usage algorithm of that compared to uh, CPAP machines to um, really help with uh, compliance to, to really further study if um, high flow will be more com compliant than CPAP. Other problems that we had was really approval, uh, approval from insurance companies. Uh, unfortunately, we can't get a approval for high flow until after we do the study and show it's successful. Um, but even then, we're, we, we still had to write a lot of uh, letters to the insurance company, um, basically begging and pleading um, for them to provide the high flow their, or the airbo uh, to the patient. Um, <clears throat> there has to really be a lot more research done in this area to really look at to see if it's going to be effective or not. And then support from the DME companies is also encouraged. In our experience, the regional and local companies uh, work really closely with us and they help us get these machines to the patients. What we've experienced is more of the national DME companies um, won't even take our orders for high flow uh, right now for sleep disordered breathing. So working with our local DME companies really help in getting the insurance companies to pay for uh, this type of treatment. So uh, some of the future um, research that should be done and that needs to be done is looking at patency versus splinting. Why is high flow really working? Um, looking at long-term compliance compared to PAP. This hasn't been really looked at and, and we are still looking at this um, and how do we um, measure compliance as well is going to be um, looked at. So long-term safety compared to PAP, not so much. We know it's safe and to use, but we don't know how often should the patient come back for another study to see if they need higher to increase the liters per minute. Um, with CPAP, we kind of know, you know, if the patient's gained weight uh, <clears throat> or if they're starting to snore or there's excessive daytime sleepiness, but can we translate that to the high flow as well? We don't know. Um, so how often do we need to think about increasing the, the liters per minute is another thing. And then also screening to see if high flow is going to be successful or not for a patient. Can we pre-screen? We know CPAP works for 99% of the patients, but it's only if they wear it, right? So yeah, we can get a successful titration, but with high flow, as you saw in the chart, not everybody's going to respond as well. So really figuring out if there's some type of pre-screening that we can do to um, know if we're going to be uh, successful before we do this the study. And is it looking at the obstructive apnea index versus the um, obstructive hypopnea index? Is one going to tell us more than the other that this might be a successful um, 
titration going going into the study or not, we don't know. Again, something we, we should look at. Any questions? 